Okay. So in this talk, I'm going to consider some inconclusive cases for the first derivative test. So what do you think I mean by inconclusive? You don't know. Well, the test doesn't tell you whether it is local max or local min. Or neither. Uh -huh. right? So it, it sort of leaves you uh, ambiguous. Okay, so inconclusive doesn't mean the case where you know it's not a local max or min. It means the case where you don't know. Okay? So we try to apply it to a function f at a critical point c. Okay, so what could be the problems? What are the situations where we cannot use the first derivative test? Well, we should go back and look at the first derivative test. Since it's not in front of us, you have to jog your memory a bit. You have to remember what are the assumptions you made in order to do the first derivative test. Well, what's the first assumption we made for the function? Hmm? Continuous. Continuous at C. So the first type of problem, therefore, we could have is that f not continuous at C. Okay? Well, this isn't really inconclusive. It's sort of saying the first derivative test is inapplicable. You cannot sort of apply the first derivative test. If you did try to use the first derivative test, you looked at the conditions, you may get a wrong conclusion. Okay, because you can still say f prime is positive on the left and negative on the right or something, but you may not have a local max. Okay, take a very quick picture of this. So you could have something like, you know, it's going down. And then... Yeah. So, so it's sort of decreasing on the immediate left. So, and it's increasing on the immediate right. And you say, oh, therefore it's a local min. But actually, it's not a local min because at the point it's sort of jumped up. Okay, right? Yeah. So, so, so therefore, if you tried to use the first derivative test of function which is not continuous, you could get incorrect conclusions. That's the first problem. Are there more problems? Well, what other problems could you have? Now, what's the next thing you assume? We assume that f is differentiable on the left and on the right. Right? If it's not differentiable on the immediate left or it's not differentiable on the immediate right, you cannot use the first derivative test. Because if the derivative doesn't exist on the left and right, then you cannot talk about whether it's positive or negative. So, what's the second problem? f is? Hmm? In, it's not differentiable on the left or... Right. right. Well, if you if it's not differentiable on, on any one side, you'd have trouble figuring out the side that side paid. Well, I'll write immediate this time. I I always mean immediate, but I don't write it every time just to save space. What's the third problem you could have? What's the third problem you could have? Third problem. So let's say it is continuous to the point and it is differentiable on the immediate left and right. Could you still run into some inconclusive case? Mm, yes. How? Mm. Okay, what do we need to do the first derivative test? We need to know whether the derivative is positive or negative on the immediate left. We need to know whether the derivative is positive or negative on the immediate right. We can allow it to be equal to zero. You lose the strictness maybe. But what gives you real trouble? Yeah? Real trouble? Yeah. Well, what happens if the derivative is oscillatory? on the immediate left. So the derivative doesn't actually take a fixed sign on the immediate left. Then what what happens? Well you just cannot you cannot it. use it's inconclusive. Mm -hmm. it, you could still have a local minimum, you could still have a local maximum or you could have neither. Okay? So so what's the third is F prime has ambiguous sign is oscillatory. So but that's not seen often, right? 
for the functions v of mc. Well, if you stay at home, you don't see the dangerous stuff, right? <laughs> so, well, we'll, we'll talk about that. If this doesn't usually happen for a good reason, okay? Uh, on immediate left or immediate right of C. So, whichever side you have that problem, you cannot figure out the behavior from that side using the first derivative test. Okay. So, yeah, now I want to talk about the sort of conclusive cases. So, let's let's do the next one. Uh, conclusive. So, so by the way, I'll, I'll do separate videos which explain these, uh, which, well, I'll do a separate one on the third one, which is tricky enough. Okay, the first two are, like, reasonably good. Now I want to talk about conclusive cases. When can the first derivative test, when can you be guaranteed that the first derivative test will work? Is there a broad class of functions for which you know for sure? You got this? Mm -hmm. So is there a broad class of functions for which you know for sure that that the first derivative test will be conclusive. So you have to avoid avoid all these three problems. Okay? So I'll just say quickly. So the first type of or the most general type of thing is for differentiable function. High at, well that's a special subcase of that, but f is a differentiable on left and right of C. Actually, that, that sort of follows from what I'm going to say next. Of C and C is an isolated critical point. What do you think I mean by isolated critical point? Well, I mean it's a critical point, but but if you look on the immediate left and right of that, there is no other critical points. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, you know what isolated means? It's far away from the other stuff, like it. Okay, if you have this type of situation, then the first derivative test will always be conclusive. Okay, and we'll talk about that some other time. Okay, now. Now, I'm going to build on this and I'm going to say f is polynomial rational function or f prime is a rational function. So, you can even apply the first derivative test fruitfully if the derivative is rational. Why, why does this second thing follow from the first thing? Well, think about polynomial. If f is a polynomial, what can you say about f prime? Is oh, a polynomial. Oh, by the way, I, I'll just assume we are dealing with non-constant functions. Because constant functions are like silly, right? You don't actually you know, want to talk about local extreme values or constant functions. Okay, so f is polynomial, the derivative will also be polynomial and if f is not constant, the derivative is non-zero. What can you say about the critical points for a polynomial? Well, it's the zeros of the derivative, which is also a polynomial. How many zeros can a non-zero polynomial have? As many as it wants. Well, in terms of the degree. So, if you have a polynomial of degree 5, the derivative has degree 4. What's the maximum number of points where the derivative can be zero? Four. So in particular, it, it's like finite, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have a finite set of points, then all of them are isolated, right? Yeah. Because you cannot have have them coming really close to each other if there's only finitely many of them, which means you can apply the the first thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for polynomials, it'll always work. So your first derivative will always be conclusive for any non-constant polynomial. Uh, for constant polynomials, it's anywhere like you know. Every point is a local maximum and nothing is strict. What about rational functions? Hmm? 
Why does the logic work for rational functions? For rational functions? Yeah. Well, the derivative of a rational function is still a rational function. Still a rational function. If the rational function is not constant, the derivative is a non-zero rational function. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to worry about critical points of the denominator become zero because when you take the derivative, you won't get any new zeros of the denominator. So if the derivative is undefined, then the original function is also undefined. So you just have to set the derivative equal to zero. How many zeros can a rational function have? Well, zeros of a rational function are the zeros of the numerator. numerator. And if the rational function, you take the derivative, that's a rational function, you look at the numerator, so there are only finitely many zeros, yep. and therefore they're all isolated. Critical point. Yeah, it's finitely many it's zeros finite. the derivative, which means finitely many critical points of the function, so they're all isolated. So you can apply this this uh, result and say that the first derivative test will be conclusive. And actually you don't even need f itself to be a rational function. f prime being a rational function is good enough. Why? Because to find the critical points, you're just setting the derivative equal to zero, yeah. right? So, so therefore, there's, there's actually one more I'll just write down. I won't talk about that because you may not have seen that. Well, you've seen that, but others who are watching this may not have. So, f is a locally analytic about c. What I mean here is that, that f has a power series about c which converges to it in some uh, positive radius ball around c. Mm. And what that essentially tells you is that it sort of tells, it sort of still comes under, under this case. Because if it's locally analytic about the point, then it, that point has to be, if it's a critical point, it has to be isolated. So in part, this actually includes things like sine and cosine and arctan and stuff. What it doesn't include are things like sine 1 over x and piecewise definitions and stuff. Okay. So the first error test, there are various inconclusive situations for it. But in practice, most of the functions you deal with, it's conclusive because in practice, this condition is usually satisfied. The critical points are usually isolated. Okay.